Okay, let's discuss. Le Corbusier is somebody that you have heard of. Um, you've studied his work. You studied his work, I believe, in Studio 2 when you looked at Villa Savoie. Probably you encountered the Five Points, one of his kind of famous manifestos of architecture. But as far as his broad career, there's a whole lot more to investigate and to learn from. So his real name is Charles Edouard Generet, and he actually renames himself kind of like Madonna or something. Um, he renames himself Le Corbusier as a kind of self-branding or promotional statement. This is, Corbusier is a French word that has two meanings. One of the meanings is to bend or to wrangle, um, as, especially as applied to metal. And the other meaning is um, kind of like a bird or flying like a bird. Um, and this is to imply that he has some sort of bird's eye view of the urban setting and of architecture. So he's all-knowing and he's strong and powerful, I suppose, is what this connotation um, invokes. And his lifespan is from 1887 to 1965, which is really a critical time period in architecture. He is just kind of... Um, coming of age or gaining awareness as an adult in the Art Nouveau period in the very late um, 1800s and the early 1900s when we know this turn of the century turmoil is happening within architecture. So he's privy to all of these types of stylistic changes. He comes from a watchmaking town in Switzerland and this influences, I suppose, his early education. There's a lot of arts education um, and attention to detail. No architecture in this town, but good arts education in his early childhood. And he um, is somebody who Nicholas Pevsner, who's an acclaimed architectural critic, has called the Picasso of architecture. So he's widely um, regarded for his influential impact on architecture all throughout his career, not just in the moments that you're maybe most familiar with. I show this image as an introduction to the man behind the architecture because I think that this has a large uh, reason or is a large reason why he is so widely revered and honestly why he was so widely published and how he became famous early in his career. He was a very early uh, master of self-branding, a very aware person. And these types of photographs are images of um, the architect who looks like this very masterful, smart person, very cleverly dressed, the glasses, the bow tie, the whole thing, um, kind of poring over drawings or carefully studying drawings is meant to show a very specific perspective of this person. So to say that he's carefully curated and aware of his public image is almost an understatement. And you can see that by the name change and then also by his set of publications that he puts out early in his career. He is also, sorry, this is pixelated. He's also the only architect to ever be on money. Um, that's an accomplishment. You know you've made it when you're on a money. Uh, this is the Swiss 10-note bill here. So he's on a Swiss dollar, essentially. Pretty awesome. So his early career, I think, is really illuminating to uh, understand some of the changes in the kind of self-education that he goes through. Le Corbusier is not formally educated in architecture. He is fully self-taught, and he essentially creates this career out of nothing. I mean, out of nowhere, he becomes very interested in architecture at a young age. He's encouraged um, to pursue it in school. He credits one of his art teachers um, as being a large influence on him, but he um, starts designing architecture when he is 17, not to make you guys feel bad, but you can't compare yourself to Le Corbusier, neither can I, <laughs> but he, he starts designing architecture when he's 17, and this is his earliest project, which is called the Villa Fale, and this is in his hometown in La Chaux de Fonds in Switzerland. He completes this project when he is 19, so by the time he's 19, he's already completed a house, which is somewhat remarkable for anyone by any standards. Um, but observing this house, Villa Fale is very clearly um, not in his kind of famous style. This looks absolutely nothing like Villa Savoie, no matter how you want to talk about it. This is a very opposite vision of architecture that he has when he first begins. 
And this probably has to do with the client. It probably has to do with the location. So he's in a kind of northern small town in Switzerland. And this looks almost like a chalet in the way that we would think of a Swiss chalet. This is a kind of local vernacular style that exists. Um, combined with his interest in what looks like an Art Nouveau style, there is a kind of clear um, pattern making that's happening here on the exterior. There are many different materials. At least we can see wood shingles. We can see glass, um, wood beams, stonework here, and I think even metal in this handrail, though I can't quite tell. Um, but the home has a whole variety of stuff going on. It's meant to look like it has a lot going on between pattern making, window mullions, the stonework that's rusticated and kind of visible or textured. Um, there are many different components to the exterior, to the style of this home. There's also, I think, maybe a more clear relationship with something like Frank Lloyd Wright's early homes based on this kind of massing where the roof is this very big heavy mass that really weighs down and sits on the volume. This first floor here is a little bit lighter and almost allows that roof mass to, to, to um, be set apart on its own. And then the ground relationship, which is pretty heavy. So looking at this, of course, all of this flip-flops eventually. The ground relationship on Villa Savoie is quite light. The roof becomes flat. Um, the windows will not have these types of mullions. They don't function in this type of way. So everything shifts. Uh, which, in a sense, if we're going to look at someone who has a remarkable early career, it's also nice to know that it's not like you just come out of the gate knowing exactly what your style is with fully formed ideas. It's nice to see his investigation and really understand how his um, mindset and his career develops. So after that house, after he's 19 and he completes the first house, he really um, sets off to educate himself properly about architecture. And this is a page from his sketchbook. And you can see very clear um, architectural detailed sketches with notes, with call outs. I mean, it's a set of diagrams and sketches that I think are really inspiring and fascinating to look at for someone who's self-taught. This is probably one of the best types of education you could give yourself is this very, very detailed amount of sketching. Um, that is not just something that people could do in 1907. You guys can all go out and make lots of sketchbooks now to really draw and understand details. It's really a different uh, investigation when you're drawing or recreating by hand a detail on a building versus if you're just going to take a photo of it and move on. I encourage you guys to sketch. Um, so he takes a trip. This is 1907 that he takes this trip. He leaves Switzerland and he goes to Italy. He goes to Milan and to Florence. Um, and he goes to some of these ancient Roman architectural sites, which is what you're seeing this sketchbook is of. And he continues his journey. This is for about a year he's gone. Um, and then in 1908, he ends up in Paris and he gets a job working for Auguste Perret. Perret is P-E-R-R-E-T. And Perret is famous for his concrete work. He is at this time working in concrete and really making incredibly beautiful concrete structures mixed with um, different types of metal reinforcements, so iron or steel. Um, Pere is investigating open floor plans. You can see this in one of his apartment buildings he creates in Paris uh, and one of the churches that he creates. So if you're interested, I would definitely take a look at Pere. Um, but this is, I, I don't know the full story of how he ends up getting this internship, but the fact that he kind of scores this as his first internship is a huge win for his career. Pere is interested in the types of things that um, will definitely set out and dictate who Le Corbusier will be and what his style will be. He also is in the right group of friends or peers to help Le Corbusier's career. So he works for Perret for two years. And in 1910, he moves on and he goes to Germany and he works for Peter Behrens. Now remember, Peter Behrens is the head of the Workbund group in Germany and he is highly influential on the Bauhaus. His style and his um, ideas and materiality are highly influential on the Bauhaus. While he's working for Peter Behrens, he meets two other people who are working for Peter Behrens at this time, who are Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe. So Le Corbusier is peers 
with Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe in this architecture office. And at this time he is, let's see, 19, he's 23? He's 23 uh, in 1910. So amazing place to be working with these people who are going to really dominate and dictate what the modern movement is. He then works there for about a year, continues his travels, leaves, continues his travels. And in 1911, this is a photo of him at the Acropolis, and he's 24 here in Athens, at the Acropolis in Greece. Again, he's studying the classics. He's taking it upon himself to go get the architectural history education um, and see for himself these, these buildings firsthand. This is an amazing thing to be able to do. Clearly, he... I would say came from a position of comfort, maybe even wealth, though I'm not privy to that information, um, and was able to do this. So as a young person, to be able to just go out and travel and then work and then travel um, is a luxury, is a, is a luxury that he takes on for himself. So after all of these travels, he's been away for two years, three years, from 1908 to 1911. He goes home uh, and he returns to La Chaux de Fons in Switzerland, and he begins to take on a few more house commissions. He also at this time starts teaching in the local art school there, not teaching architecture, but teaching um, arts, I suppose. So one of the houses he creates, and the first house he creates upon returning home from this journey is for his family. And this is uh, Villa Genere Pere. So Le Corbusier is creating this building this home for his parents and it seems like in comparing this building to some of his early other structures that he has some amount of leeway in terms of what the design outcome is so if you are having a commission by your parents you might be given a little bit more leeway than a, a, a different commission from a different client who's not a family member and not kind of willing to let you um, experiment with their money and their property so in this home very different looking than the Villa Falle. If we just jump back and look at the Villa Falle, incredibly different in almost every way. Um, this particular home, all of a sudden there's a kind of lack of materiality that happens with this white abstract material. We know that this is um, masonry covered with plaster, so it's purposefully painted white to be able to allude to concrete or allude to some sort of plastic form. And the actual volumetric of this is now a little bit more cubic. It's not as, um, there aren't, there is no kind of heavy gable. This, this image also obscures the roof line, and this is on purpose. Most of the images of this home that Le Corbusier is in control of obscure the roof line because his agenda would, or his goal would have been to have a flat roof, but that doesn't happen in this climate and with this client. Um, a couple other n things to note, you have this kind of series of glass block windows here, which is a, a very um, pared down version of a window compared to Villa Falle, which was decorated, it had scrolls, the mullions were kind of expressive. Here they turned into just a grid. And then your windows emphasize horizontality here. This is almost like an early ribbon window, you might say. And the small details here, um, the handrail, evokes the idea of a, a steamship and this is on purpose he will eventually kind of declare his allegiance or his association with machinery but at this time he's taking on that visual language as a way of just communicating something streamlined and aligned with machinery or with technological advancement in 1912. So this is his rendered hand sketch or his rendering of the particular home that we're just looking at for his family and this is where you can see that he is intending for you to not notice the roof line. Um, this is kind of a, not exactly a worm's eye view, but it's sort of a low uh, perspective for a rendering. This is a quite odd choice of a view. You guys understand that now. If you were to make a rendering of your studio work from this direction, it would be a little bit confusing because a person in this view would really be like crouching or laying down. So this is a purposeful choice to, to represent the aspects of the design that he wants you to see and that he wants you to focus on. Um, and then off to the left over here, 
this little outdoor um, pergola area is apparently inspired by his time at the Acropolis and inspired by Greek architecture. So he includes this kind of folly um, in the landscape. And there's an image of him and his dad next to this little moment, which is over here. Um, but before they go up the stairs leading up, and you can see the handrail a little bit better here, but father and son in the building that the son produces, a nice image, and we're on our way. Um, actually, let me go back. Oops. The last thing I want to mention here is the next commission he has. So in 1912, the year that he's completing the house for his parents, he's also completing this house for a, a not a family client. Um, this is Villa, Fav Villa Favre Jaco. And this is for the head of a watchmaking company at this time. So he's from a watchmaking area in Switzerland. This is a neighboring town. And the client was the head of Zenith Watches, um, which is a big watch company. So at the age of 25 here in 1912, he is commissioned with a fairly large um, project that is for someone of stature in the community. And so he delivers what the client wants, and you can see a very different style emerging. Still elements of this kind of pared-down, um, abstract, flat materiality and some of the handrail details here, but much more ornamentation, a pronounced gabled roof. So you can see the influence of what's kind of locally accepted or what's in fashion versus his own maybe more modernist or extreme ideas at this time, which are going to be aligned with the Bauhaus, not with this type of construction. Okay. Next video, we'll get to